Okay, so uh, my volume on this is a bit high. Okay, um, so today we are jumping once more from the client side to the server side. So we started working with a standalone application, then we went to the browser, and now that okay, we learned how to manage more or less the front end in React, uh, we feel the need of having a place to store or the, the data that the application is working with. Okay, right now, uh, the application we, we are creating are more or less fully functional, except that the data they work on is just some fake data structure that we uh, write in the code. Uh, the real place for storing the, the data that the application should read and uh, the place where the application should store new information is uh, a database uh, lying on a server uh, somewhere, okay? So today we'll uh, uh, see the technologies for making that happen, how to create a, a web server, and how to use this web server as an uh, um, API server, so a server where we, that can expose some functions, some APIs uh, that will allow uh, next week uh, our application to uh, read and write data uh, from the server itself. So uh, just remember that uh, in our architecture, we will have uh, one server that will host the data, and this server will be used by possibly many clients, many browsers. All the users that are navigating our application will connect to the same server, which is a central point. So we are no longer having many independent applications, but there are many applications that will uh, uh, share the same server, share the same data, hmm? and so we'll have in some points uh, to care about the synchronization of possible multiple clients. So we need to be careful at what happens there. Huh? Um, okay. Uh, in, uh, in the JavaScript world, there are, as, we, as usually uh, happens, uh, uh, many alternatives for creating a web server. We are using one of the most uh, uh, popular options, which is called uh, uh, Express, or Express, depending where you want to put the, ac the accent. And uh, it's a simple framework uh, for creating uh, uh, a web server, so uh, an application that is able to respond to queries uh, using the HTTP protocol and uh, uh, to activate uh, you know, a single piece of code of your your code according to which uh, uh, URL was called on our server through HTTP. Mm -hmm. uh, Express can be used in many different ways. You can use it to create uh, normal websites, so the one that serve different pages and different URLs, uh, not the, the, um, the React way, the single page application of React, which only have one page and do everything else in JavaScript, but you can use a, a traditional page-based uh, development, um, you can host uh, static components, uh, you can host uh, uh, the bundle, the JavaScript bundle of a React application, or you can host uh, some APIs. So basically, depending on what you want to do, you can have a template where in the server you have the HTML pages, let's say, with templates for creating them, or we are just serving, in that, like in our case, we are just uh, serving data. Okay, we are using the Express just for offering a set of APIs, a set of uh, um, uh, points that we can call, endpoints that we can call to manage uh, the data related to an application, to our application. Okay, so we will, let's say, uh, not uh, uh, look uh, or we'll uh, just, just ignore the parts of Express that deal with generation of HTML pages because we are not generating HTML pages. That, those will be generated in, uh, in uh, React. And of course, uh, uh, the whole point of this is that, is that uh, this web server will store data into a database. Uh, so, so we resume what we did with uh, SQLite, for example, and say, okay, now uh, the data stored in the database, uh, it will no longer be manipulated by normal function calls, uh, but they will be, data will be read or will be modified according to some calls that arrive at the HTTP level. But one step at a time. Um, all of this uh, 
um, lies on the idea that we can exploit, uh, well, we can hijack basically the HTTP protocol for uh, implementing an API layer. Hmm? Uh, I will not explain you for the 15th time uh, the, the, the HTTP protocol, uh, which is based, uh, we know, on a, an exchange of messages, a request and a response. Okay? Uh, there is strong directionality in HTTP. The request also always come from a client to a server, and the response always come from the server to the client, always in response to a request. Okay? They always go uh, and in end. Uh, but we, what we want uh, to stress here, to um, say, have a look at some more details uh, about uh, the inner structure of this request and response. Normally, we don't care so much because uh, all the HTTP messaging is handled by the browser. So the browser knows how to make a request, and how, uh, knows how to pass a response, and so on. Now, we are going to use the same protocol by ourselves, uh, by making calls our ourselves, so we need uh, uh, a bit more of information on how to handle it. HTTP is very simple because the, both the request and the response have the same structure. They have a first line that gives us the command. We have some headers following the first line, and uh, we may have a body. So both of them, the request message and the response message, they have the same structure. Of course, the type of uh, initial line and the type of headers that are supported will be different. Uh, but uh, the idea is that they are both uh, some text uh, uh, message that may or may not have a body, depending on what we see next, uh, and if they have a body, it will be separated by the headers uh, with, a, with a blank line. And the headers can give you some, are uh, always of the form name value, name column value, so we can have a set of uh, uh, header types, header names, uh, with their possible values. Uh, this is the structure that we have. Uh, in the request, uh, the initial line is actually the command that we want to uh, execute. The first command is uh, the method name. Then the second is the path uh, corresponding to the URL. And then there, there is, we have the uh, HTTP version. That can be 1.1, 1.2 uh, normally. Um, Normally, when we're navigating websites, uh, the method is always get, except when we are submitting a form in a traditional web application, uh, that uh, some, the form of submission usually uses the, the post verb. Okay? Actually, HTTP defines, defines uh, a, a, a longer list uh, of methods or comments, if we want to call them. And uh, this is the definition that the HTTP protocol more or less gives for these methods. So gets requests a representation of a resource. Uh, posts submit a new resource, submit new data. Okay. Put is a verb that is never used by, by browsers. So a browser will never emit put, but it's supported by the protocol, and we will use it uh, for replacing some data. And delete, OK, it deletes some specific resource. Uh, these are not used in normal web navigation, but we can exploit these the semantics, these definitions, for, um, for giving a meaning to the operation that we do on data. Hmm? We'll see that in a moment. Uh, the, the response, initial line, the main line, is basically a status code, contains basically a status code, the famous 404 that we find when the browser doesn't find a page, so the server is responding. This page is not on this server, okay? And the status code is always composed, okay, the protocol version is always there. Uh, the status code is composed of a three-digit numerical code plus a text, a description text. And then we have the headers and possibly the body. And, uh, uh, Okay, normally, the status codes are generated by the server, but since we are implementing the servers, we'll be, it will be up to us you know, to decide which kind of code to return. So the normal code uh, returned 
when everything goes okay is 200 okay and uh, if uh, the request uh, could not be carried on we should uh, generate an error code in the range 400 or 500 basically 400 means that the request was not was not valid so I'm requesting a page which uh, didn't exist or I'm trying to add uh, uh, an item which already is duplicated and so I cannot uh, accomplish the, the, um, the operation because the information you gave me is wrong. So it's your fault, 400. Or 500, it's my fault as a server. So the request was okay, but for my own reasons, I cannot carry it uh, on because maybe the connection with the database is not uh, uh, valid uh, or I exhausted the, the resources uh, or something like that. Huh? It should never happen uh, normally or I have a bug in my and something crashes on my side. Uh, I have an unhandled un exception or something like that. Uh, and so I should return a call like this. So usually norm normally we have these uh, uh, three or four calls that usually are uh, a return hmm? it will be up to us to return those and the header lines i won't get into those because there are uh, literally hundreds of, of a type of headers uh, we will focus uh, basically on the um, the application content uh, that describes the type of request body but uh, uh, you have uh, uh, really hundreds of different headers for uh, managing all the types, uh, all, all the details of the connection. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, one important uh, header, as I mentioned, is called the content type. So if a request or a response has a, does have a, ba a body, the bo this body normally is some text content. And how this text should be treated, how should be parsed, uh, is specified by the content type header on the request or on the response. So content type is telling me how to parse the body that I'm sending or I'm receiving. Uh, in a normal web navigation, the content type would be text HTML. So I'm returning in the response an HTML page. When we exchange data, normally data will be formatted according to the JSON format. So we need to specify uh, if I'm sending some request body in JSON or I'm sending some res response with a uh, JSON body, we n must remember to specify in the headers our content type to be application slash JSON. Mm -hmm. uh, if we, we fail to, to do this, uh, then the JavaScript code that should parse the JSON will not be able to do that, usually, because it will not recognize that this is a valid JSON. Uh, we see in the code uh, where this happens. Uh, I said before that the body is, uh, may be uh, present in some requests or in some uh, responses. Basically, this is the table from the specification that tells me whether a body is uh, permitted, denied, or forbidden, or allowed in the different types of requests. So normally a request body should must be present uh, in post and put and must not be present in get. In some cases may be present in delete depending on whether you need or not. And in, for the request. And uh, so it, it's an error to send a post without a body for example, okay? Uh, and in the response uh, the body is always present in get because yeah, I'm asking to get some data and so the data should be there in the body of the response uh, and uh, for the other calls uh, it depends no? it may be there or not depending on the protocol allows both both uh, uh, cases okay you have you may have a post with no response or you have a response body you will have only the response headers or you may have a post with the response in uh, with the response body in, in it uh, another Attribute here is whether the implementation of these methods should be idempotent potent or not. So we are talking about the specification of the protocol. So there's no magic there. Uh, it says if you are implementing 
the, uh, the code for handling one of these calls, you should implement that in a way that, uh, in this case, in the get, for example, or put, uh, are idempotent. What does it mean? Idempotent means that if I'm doing the same call twice in a row, then the result is the same as doing it only once. Uh, if I repeat the same call, I will get the same result. Okay? So for get, for get, <laughs> don't forget anything, uh, for the get uh, method, if I'm doing a get and immediately after I'm redoing the same get with the same parameters, I should receive the same identical response. If not, uh, then I'm, I'm implementing something wrong. Okay? Of course, is the, in the meantime, the data changes in the back end, it's normal to have a, a, a different result. But I'm thinking of uh, uh, calling to it twice immediately. Hmm? And uh, this doesn't happen with post. So repeating a post is not a safe operation. Because post means add something. If I add something twice, I will be adding two items. Or maybe only the first one and the second gives an error because they have an application, a duplicate item, or depending. So repeating two posts means doing the action twice. Repeating two guesses means having a copy of the same. Uh, the put operation is meant to replace a current value with a new value. And so if I replace it twice, the end result is always the same. I have the new value. And not adding or creating anything new. Okay, so we should keep this in mind when we implement our methods, uh, so that uh, there is no, uh, no side effects with uh, with put that maybe uh, could change the results if I call it twice. Hmm? Uh, the only exception is this post is no. Hmm? Okay, we don't care about uh, whether these methods can be generated by HTML forms because we will call them directly from JavaScript code. Okay, so this was just a, a quick recap of, of uh, <coughs> HTTP. We should remember or, uh, that we can exploit all the methods uh, uh, supported by the language, uh, by the protocol, uh, for our purposes. So, how can we create uh, an application that can respond uh, to these methods? As I mentioned, we are going to use uh, Express, which is a normal you know, JavaScript package, you can install it with NPM, as usual. Just remember, we are back on the server side, okay? So we are no, using Node.js, uh, and we are using the, the syntax of Node for, uh, for example, uh, use strict, uh, uh, require instead of import, and something like that, okay? Um, this is one of the many frameworks uh, okay, that are available for extending the HTTP module, which is already a built-in module in, uh, in uh, Node.js, but it's a very low-level uh, mechanism. So we prefer something which is easier to use. Um, so actually, we are, what we are doing, we are creating a normal JavaScript file, let's say index.js or server.js, hmm? and we run it with Node, and uh, this script will activate a server using the Express library. Um, every time, we, so we are starting our server. While developing, it may happen that we do something wrong, and so we need to stop the server, modify the code, and then restart the server again. Hmm? That becomes quite boring, or you can forget to restart the server, and so it will not reread your updated script. Hmm? So there is a, a utility which is called uh, uh, Nodemon, stands for node monitor, that uh, you can install, uh, the suggestion is to install it with minus G, so it's, all, it's not installed in your project, uh, but globally on your computer. So it's available for a project and doesn't uh, become a dependency of the project itself. And by running Nodemon, it will monitor the script files. It will monitor any change in index.js or in any files uh, imported by index.js. So you can edit your project normally. When you save, Nodemon will um, realize that there is a um, change file and will automatically stop and restart your server. 
so it's very handy when you're developing okay so launching with node mode so if uh, um, it will automatically you know uh, uh, restart and uh, we we are used to do that uh, in um, in react so react already has this modality where you are there's a live update uh, of the application when you modify the server by default uh, express doesn't have any so a mechanism of this time of this kind uh, but with node mode uh, we can use it or if you want you can just start it by hand each and every time you modify something okay uh, so what does a web application in Express look like? It's very simple, actually. Uh, you import the Express module, of course. You call the Express function, which is the only function exported by the module, and you, it will create uh, an application object. So Express is not the application, it's just a function that you use to create the application. And to run the website, uh, you just have to call the listen method on the application object. Listen will start a web server on the specified port, HTTP port. And once the application is started, it will simply call a callback saying, OK, I'm ready. So you can do what you want uh, in this callback just to say to uh, Anything you need to do after the application is, is started, asynchronously, you, normally. Uh, you don't do anything. Abdos listen is a, a, an asynchronous call, as, you, as always. So the script usually finishes. Here is the last statement in your script. But uh, Node.js doesn't stop executing your code because there are still some callback, callbacks ongoing. Okay? So the script is finished. Uh, by the execution doesn't exit. It will still keep running until there is something in the asynchronous queue. And, and, uh, and so your program basically will stop here and start listening to asynchronous requests, which will come on this port, on this TCP IP port, uh, using the HTTP protocol. And this request can request any page, let's say, any URI on this server. And you can decide which requests, which URIs you want to handle by defining some routes of the application, by adding some routes of the application that you want to handle. By default, if you open a server like this, it will not respond to any page. I want to respond to the home page call, to the slash URI. I need to define a route that responds to this route slash when called with the method get. Okay, so uh, a command in an HTTP command is remember the first line of the request method name and URI. If I want to handle a method name for, for specific URI that in Expert they are called routes. Don't confuse them with React routers. Um, I have to specify to add with the get method the specific route that they want to listen to. So whenever a HTTP request comes in on this route, on this URI with this method, this callback is executed. And the callback receives two parameters, request and response. Request and response are two JavaScript objects that represent, you guess, the HTTP request and the HTTP response. The request object contains information about the request we just received. So the array, the parameters, the body, the headers, if you want. So we can query the request object to understand what, the, what we need to do. And the response object is an object that, that has methods that will ha help us to build the response that we are going to send to our client. Um, so the general syntax is for adding a route, 
to be handled is app dot application dot method name so it can be post can be get can be delete can be put all the HTTP methods so we can specify the method that we want to handle the path that we want to register and the under function and it's always like this um, the callback function which is where we write actually our code can access these two objects re request and response uh, I tried here to highlight uh, which are the most important properties or uh, methods that these two objects offer okay so for example the request object remember it's incoming a request something that comes to me I can query the, the body content so I can extract the body content I can extract uh, the parameters of the routes we'll see in a moment that the routes can also be defined dynamically like we did in react so having a matching uh, parts uh, variables in the matching variable parts in the URI so we can extract them from parameters or we can extract the query parameters so if I have a query with a URI with question mark and some data I can extract this data from the query attribute so actually what Express does is to parse the text of the HTTP re uh, request and give me an object with some properties that I can query uh, to access to uh, to access to the information and the most important part is building the response I must give a response to every request otherwise the browser on the other side will keep waiting and sooner or later will time out even if I don't have anything to tell you I must still close the request with an answer maybe an empty one uh, but it's mandatory to close the response and closing the response can be done in uh, uh, some ways. The simple one, end. Send an empty response. Or send, send a, a complete response with a body. Send a body in the response. Or, uh, well, there is a JSON method that can take it, an object and convert it to JSON and put it into the body of the response itself so it's a, a variation of the send message can send any text string JSON will take an object convert it to JSON and send it mm -hmm. so it's easier for us if we are need if we need to, to send a, a JSON object and so on there's some uh, uh, other method but the most important idea is that I receive a request uh, I use the, par the properties of the request to understand what I need to do I do it so I need to quiz database or to add some data into the, into the database or whatever and then I build the response that I need to send when I call and or send or JSON then Express will ship the response and close this call and forget about, forget about it okay uh, so the way we close a function is not by returning anything from this function but we need to call one of these uh, and JSON send or maybe redirect if you want to redirect to another URL some way to s actually send the response hmm? um, in case we need to send a status which is different from the 200 which is the default we can use it by calling status on the response uh, before sending the actual data for example uh, the status method returns the response object itself so you can change the calls if we want but send and and JSON will all close the request the response sorry so the full transaction will be completed the server will forget about what happened give the response to the browser and then it's the business of the browser we don't care anymore um, okay so to to see in practice what we can do um, let's create uh, a folder demo HTTP 
something like that. And we open it, we create uh, an Express project into that, uh, uh, yes, an um, NPM project, so NPM init. Uh, and uh, yes to everything. So actually we are creating a package.json there, and we need to populate package.json with the Express middleware, okay? NPM install Express. And now we can create uh, our index.js file with the minimum skeleton for the Express application is uh, we enter strict mode and uh, we load the Express module const Express require Express right we create an application object, uh, app equal to express, function call, and finally, the app the listen on a given port, say 3000, and the callback that will tell us server started. Like that. So this is the minimal empty um, web application. If we start it to run it, I can use node index.js, and you see you will print server started, or I use nodemon index.js in the same way. And not when we tell me that it's watching, okay, some files. Uh, so whenever they change, the server will start. If I change something here and they save the file, I see that Nodman figures it out and restarts the server. So we just start it once and let it run. Okay, this is a quite uh, um, sad web server because it doesn't serve any page. If I try to open a browser, and look for localhost 3000, I get an error. Cannot get slash, for example. What happened at the network level? I load the page. At the network level, uh, I made a request to this localhost 3000, and the server replied with a response that was, uh, I cannot, with a response of the command was get uh, HTTP localhost, uh, and the status code of the response was 404. This was returned by, by us, by our server. Uh, it's different, if I stop the server, for example, uh, I stopped it now, I try to reload this page, I'm not getting an error, I'm getting a timeout. So the browser is waiting for this to respond and then will tell me enough, nobody's responding to me. If I run the server, the server will respond and tell me there's no web page at this address. No route is configured for responding to a get on this address. So let's configure one. So we can have a app.get, we want to respond to the get method on the slash, on the home page. So app.get is a method name, and the first parameter is a string representing the, the route. And the second parameter is the callback, request, response. Callback, function, body. And in this body, we write what we want to happen when a browser connects to this address. Okay. Uh, for example, we send out uh, some HTML file or some text file or some response in some way. So the easiest part would be to uh, response dot send a string
any string. So the send will populate the body of the response, which is mandatory in the case of get, and send the response itself, closing this callback. So if I save this and reload this page, now I get this text. So you see that the browser made a get call. The status code of the response was 200, which is the default, if I don't change the status. And the response body is uh, just some text uh, writing, reading hello there, that then the browser just displayed to me. Um, yeah, we have no request, and the headers, you see that in the inspector that I have the request headers below. There's a lot of them because the browser will send a lot of stuff with every request. And these are the response headers, the headers of the response that I just created. It's telling me that the content is text slash HTML, well, it's not really HTML, it's just raw text. But I can write HTML in that string if I want. And it's powered by Express and something like that. No? And this is the date of returning. So these are the response that Express generated for me, including the status code of 200. Of course, if I navigate somewhere else, I get, again, an error. Okay, because there's no route defined there. Um, so this is the, the very, very simple basic mechanism. If I want to, well, there's no, no, no actually in slash, uh, there's no useful information in the route. So we cannot query for the moment uh, the request object for doing anything. Uh, we are playing with a browser to make the calls. Uh, but uh, in reality, we, will, uh, we are not going to develop a web application on this server. We are just going to develop some APIs. So the browsers, in a way, is not the best way for testing this website. Uh, because, for example, I can, from the browser, I cannot issue uh, a put with the body I want. Or cannot issue a, a delete or a put method because the, the browser is only thought for we will learn to do that in javascript but for the moment how, we, how can we test different type of methods with different types of uh, body in the request and so on oh there's one easy solution there are many okay but one easy solution is an extension of um, vs code that is called uh, rest explorer yeah rest client is one that contains a small HTTP client uh, that we can program with some simple text commands. Uh, so it will be useful for us to make some, uh, instead of opening the browser and seeing what's there, having that directly into the VS Code. And the way it works, uh, if you install this uh, REST client, uh, it's very simple. You just open, in our project, uh, you open a file with an HTTP extension. So, you know, test.http. Okay? Uh, and inside this file, you can write an HTTP request, information about an HTTP request. For example, the first line, get slash. and then the version HTTP 1.1 if you want. So you are writing in the text file the request you want to issue. And you see that it will generate you a small link called send request. If you click here, the extension will issue the request to the server. And of course, uh, it was rejected because they forgot about the localhost uh, and port, so the full address. Sorry. HTTP, localhost, 3000, slash. OK. Now I send the request, and the extension pops up a new window with the response. This is actually the response that we got from the server. If we want to test uh, another URL, 
We can do that. We need to separate them, the different requests with three hashes to separate the blocks. And maybe we want to, to test another URL, uh, I don't know, ABC, like we did before. We know it doesn't exist. We see what happens. And you see that if you separate them with the three hashes, each of them has its own uh, send link. So if I click here, I get the response, which is a not found response with an error body, which is automatically generated by, uh, by Express in this case. So it's easy to have a file with all the tests that we want to do on that API addresses and just click there to see the response. The syntax uh, uh, no, the, of this um, REST client uh, is actually allows for you actually to put uh, the a full request. So if you want uh, to add some headers uh, in the request, you can do that. I don't know, font and type uh, equal to application.json. This doesn't make any sense here, but you can add some um, headers to the request if you want to send them. And you, if you want also, you can add a body. You can do that uh, just by separating with a, an empty line and have some text. So this is the full HTTP request uh, message that will be sent, will be passed and sent uh, according to, to, the, to the protocol. And in this case, it doesn't change anything, of course, uh, um, but uh, we, be, because it's just a simple get, so these two are ignored in, in our case. But just remember, when, when we're doing more complex requests, so we can write them down here and see what happens. Mm -hmm. So a good way just both for saving a little documentation, but also ready to test uh, without writing code in the, in the browser or something like that. Okay. So these are uh, the, the basic, uh, uh, say, mechanism of, of, uh, of Express is just uh, this uh, route uh, and this handle function. Actually, Express is more complex, but because you may, we may want uh, to customize in some way uh, the operations done by Express itself. What they mean is that uh, uh, right now, our code will need to do everything. But maybe there, maybe there are some common functionalities that we want to exploit. For example, logging. We want to log every request, to write down what the request we get, you know, just to, for debugging or for logging purposes. And so, okay, we can write a console.log everywhere, but it would be easier to have, uh, just to say, okay, add a logging statement in every call you receive. So adding some extra functions to execute at every call or security. We want to check uh, that uh, uh, the issuer of a request uh, is authorized to do that and should be done on each and every route. So we should add a function and say, okay, before executing my callback, please execute another one before. That will do logging, check security, uh, parse the body in JSON and something like that. So we are extending, in a way, the basic functionality of Express with some actions that will be done at every request. In the Express library, this is called a middleware. A middleware is just a function that is designed to do some pre-processing of a request. So, the middleware is just a function that receives the request object, the result object, may check them, may modify them, and when it's done, it just calls the next function to proceed to the actual processing of the, of the request or to the processing of the next middleware in case there are more than one register. So we can define some functions with the signature to do some processing of, of, on our, um, let's say, requests. 
and uh, when we define a, a route we just after the path and before our callback we specify one middleware or an array of middlewares that will be called in sequence before my function there are two facilities for this one is that if we are if we need to apply the same middleware to all the requests we don't need to specify that with every each and every uh, method each and every route but we can use the use method on the application so app.use registers a middleware to be automatically applied on every request or on a subset of the requests uh, matching some initial path so say we want to add some logging for example okay to be sure that to print every request we receive and we process so we can define for example one, uh, one function uh, as a function that takes request response and next and does a sim simply a console.log of maybe request.path if I remember correctly path is the one let's see the slides yeah the URL path that we received and maybe the method method dot method so request dot method plus display space plus request dot path and then we call next this is just a function we can apply this middleware function to our uh, get method for example and if we try it again, if I didn't do any mistake, the request gets through, and we see in the console that they printed something. Again. If I click somewhere else, of course, it will not be called because it's only tied to that specific route. So in this case, I defined a middleware doing something on the request and on the response before the actual call and then next uh, we proceed to the next middleware or to the actual um, callback if i want to apply logging to all methods it's easier to register it at the application level so app.use login so i don't need to specify it here it will be applied automatically by the way also to the request that don't that don't match because actually is applied before okay so it's a nice way of uh, factoring together common operations that we need to do on every call we just define the middleware function so they call it middleware I would prefer to call it them pre-processing no way but anyway and uh, um, normally this middle will never call send or end to issue the response even if they could maybe in the case of an error but they simply call next to go forward with the processing hmm? and then we register them so we say specify better how we want to handle by default all the requests um, of course, in, uh, in um, say, in Express, in the Express modules, there are already a lot of middlewares that are already predefined. For example, what is that? For logging, which is the example I just did, there's already a middleware called Morgan, don't ask me why, that uh, can be used to do the logging. So we don't need, for the most common operation, 
for validation, for logging, for uh, authorization. We don't need to create our own middlewares. We just we can just import them and use them. So, for example, in this case, uh, we can install this package and use it as a middleware instead of uh, our own function. So I need to stop the server because I need to install npm install morgan, for example, and uh, we. load it, and we register it. Uh, yeah. So we don't need this code anymore, because we registered one logger. No, no, sorry, not one. And uh, calling a send request will print this code. If you read the, the Morgan documentation, it will tell you how to specify the format in which you want the logged statement printed. There are several formats predefined and so on. So it's already richer and more complete than what we could do by hand. But the idea is the same. There's nothing special, nothing strange. It's just a, a function that we does some pre-processing and then goes next. Okay, uh, there's another middleware that can, we won't use it uh, uh, so much, uh, but it can be used by websites if you want to, um, normally every request uh, must be processed uh, uh, dynamically. So we, you need some JavaScript code to send out some result. But if you just want to send out an image or a file or a static CSS file, for example, it would be stupid to uh, write a, a callback that will lo load this file and send it. So again, this is a, a behavior for a middleware called static that uh, registers a folder in your project and will automatically create routes for every file in that folder that will just send out the file itself. So it will serve static content. In an API server, usually we don't have any static content, so we don't care so much. But in a real application, we have folders where we have the images, uh, all the graphical assets, uh, image videos, uh, icons, uh, CSS files, uh, script files, and so on. Then we want just to ship to the client without any processing on our side. And so they can be put into a static directory and just uh, be automatically served by the middleware. So the middleware will see that and just reply with the correct file without any route defined by us. You, are, you only define the folder from which to get the information and maybe the URL on which you want to publish this data. This will be processed before any dynamic routes. So first of all, experts will check whether the file you are requesting is in this folder. If so, we will respond. Otherwise, we'll try to match one of your routes hmm? um, so that you can have a, a mixture of dynamic routes and static routes. Um, a query can be complex. A URI can be complex, so you may have some extra uh, information. For example, in a, get, in a get request, you can have par some parameters with a question mark. How can you extract this information in the um, server side? It's very easy. In the request object is a query property that is an object automatically populated with all the parameters. And so this object can have some properties, for example, user. So you can get it from rec.query.user. And the pass is rec.query.pass and something like that. So it's automatic. No, no middleware is required for this behavior. Hmm? So for example, let's try it. If we want to change to have a parameter like uh, language equal to Italian, for example, this is not part of the route. So it's, we are still calling the slash route, but with one parameter. 
Okay, I added something after a question mark, which only adds some query parameters and doesn't modify the route. If I want to extract this information, I can do that uh, by extracting request dot query dot language. We should check if it's there or not, because we don't know if language uh, if it's available and uh, Maybe language is Italian. Uh, sorry, what did I write it in uppercase or lowercase? Uppercase, okay. Then we can send a different uh, response, just a stupid example. Otherwise, so we send the English version. So in this case, if I send a request, I should see that the response is in Italian because I have this parameter. If this parameter will be English or something else, then the response, send a request, will be in English. And even if I leave out the parameter, again, I get the English version because that's how I implemented it. So always remember to check whether a parameter is present or not. Don't do that directly because you get, uh, well, in this case it would be an undefined. Uh, undefined equal to AT would be wrong, but it's better to, uh, to check. Especially if you are uh, asking for sub-properties, you will get a uh, language can, can be undefined because it depends on whether it's uh, on the query string or not. Um, Another possibility of passing some data to the server, okay, one is in the query parameters, the other is, the, is the, in the request body. That can only, only happen in post or put comments. Uh, the second line, uh, uh, we don't care about the second line because it's the encoding down by the browser when we submit a form. It's not a behavior that we are interested in. Um, we want to store some data in JSON that we create, okay, in our body. And so, how can we extract this data? Okay, there's a property called body from which we can extract the properties related to the JSON information that we got. Uh, this is not automatic. To be able to parse uh, in the body of the response uh, uh, this JSON file, we will need to load and activate uh, the JSON middleware. Okay, app.use, express.json. It's a middleware which is, you see, express. Dot. It's already in the express uh, uh, library. You don't need to install anything else. But it needs to be activated. So, for example, this only works with post or put. So let's implement a post call. Okay, for example, we want to implement uh, a post for, uh, let's say, add some data hmm? and uh, with the request response uh, function body. So a post is the same as a get, nothing special, nothing different. Uh, we want to extract, we assume that uh, the add uh, method will will be a post call that will carry in the body the object uh, with the information that we want to add. Mm. So, for example, let's write the text before. We want to uh, post uh, HTTP localhost 3000 add HTTP. And we want to send an object like, that looks like uh, uh, I don't know, ID is three and uh, name is uh, ABC, whatever. Uh, the JSON format looks like uh, a JavaScript object format, but uh, remember that uh, you have a constraint that the quotes should always be double quotes and uh, the property names must always be quoted. In JavaScript it's optional to quote them or not, in JSON, it's uh, mandatory. 
and you can use it cannot use single quotes other than that you are just using a JavaScript syntax for arrays and uh, and objects and important don't forget if I'm sending a body with a JSON content I should specify the content type in the headers to be JSON so I'm making a post call by telling you, okay, this is a post call to add, and giving you a body with this string to be interpreted as a JSON content. With this call, we can have these two parameters, ID and ABC, to be extracted by the body from the body of the request. To be able to extract from JSON content, we should remember to register the JSON parser. Express.json. Huh? Because it gives you a, a little overhead, so it will not, it's, done, it's not done automatically. You need to ask for it, okay? And in this case, we have, uh, we can have console, for example, dot log request dot body dot id and let's see if something comes out and uh, the other is name so if we call this we should see in the console yeah three and abc so in the HTTP request, we have a post with a JSON body that has some properties, and you can extract these properties in our server by querying the body property of the request. If we just remember, there are two conditions for this to work. First, the, the middleware must be loaded, and second, the request must be tagged as JSON. Otherwise, the middleware will not be activated. We say, okay, this is a normal request. It doesn't give me JSON, so I don't need to parse it. If you leave this out by mistake, you see undefined. The JSON body has been sent, but has not been parsed because the JSON middleware doesn't see the content type that it should be responsible for. Okay, so both conditions should handle. I'm stressing this because it's very easy to forget, okay, and say, okay, nothing's working. Okay. Um, so two, two ways of passing information from the browser to the server, query parameters and request body. With a get method, you can use query parameter or request body, so it's allowed to have a body in the get, but especially in the post and put, you are it's, the, the, it's mandatory to have a body in the request. That can be extracted easily. And there's a, another way of passing information to the server is to have dynamic routes. So in a, in a route, you can not just specify a string as a path, but also more complex expressions that will match more routes. We don't want to be crazy with regular expressions, uh, but the idea is that we, we uh, can write a single route matching many different URIs. And this gives me the opportunity of uh, storing some information inside the URI. Might be the ID of an object. Hmm? And uh, actually, it can be done more easily by forgetting regular expression with the dynamic segments uh, of routes. This is a syntax which is very, very similar to what we had in the React router. Some segment of the, of the path may have a, a column in front of them by saying this is a dynamic segment. So this get will match everything with slash user slash something, slash books, slash something else. These segments are free. They can be anything. They will be matched, and the value of this segment 
actually assigned by the user to these segments uh, will be available in the params parameters property of the request so in this case request.params contains a property called user id the same as this segment with this value 34 extracted from the uri and the second property called book id like the second uh, dynamic segment with the value 899 extracted from the URI. And we can use that inside. Hmm? So for example, in our case, uh, in our post, uh, we can decide we want to add uh, to item number seven. That's seven. I want to add this object to the you know, container number seven. So the URI contains an, a fixed segment, which is maybe the command, and a variable segment, a dynamic segment with a value. And if we want to extract that in our post, it should be add colon mm, container. And we can extract this information from uh, request dot parameters params dot container. So we can say oh, adding to container number whatever. And we, if we call this method, we say that, okay, add it to container number seven because the URI wrote that. I also get an error here because uh, I, right now this method doesn't send a response. So at least I should close the request response.end because it's an error not to close uh, a callback with and, send, or JSON. And so right now, if I try again with the, okay, the post, uh, I'm, I'm seeing the logger and I'm seeing the, the output uh, from the console in a strange order. <laughs> because it's asynchronous so we don't uh, we cannot rely on the order the logger is, is actually executed before the body but the printout comes out after but we are not surprised at that but now res re response.end will actually correctly generate a response and close the transaction otherwise the caller will, will time out and then if we are in actual code will generate an exception a timeout exception Okay, so always remember that. So we have the basic mechanism, uh, then we'll see how to exploit the mechanism uh, for defining routes uh, that contain values, parametric values. Routes that, are, that implement different methods, post or get, and routes that do any type of processing we want inside and generate a response. The only, thing we did, the only thing we didn't see is to how to generate a JSON response, for example, which is very easy. Well, it's in the slides. Uh, oh, it's there. No, it isn't. Okay, so forget about it. Um, for example, if we want to read some information okay and they want it to be represented by an object imagine we get HTTP localhost 3000 and uh, info I don't know we define a route for extracting information simple get it doesn't need any anybody info 
So we can define another route, app.get slash info slash request response function body semicolon go. So in this case, maybe we want the uh, information to be given. Could be maybe uh, I don't know an object uh, with a property called uh, name equal to set to I don't know I don't know ABC D or X Y Z. Let's change it and uh, I don't know values. Uh, maybe a list of integers, three, six, and eight. So maybe we get this from query database, some information. We have an object that contains information that we, sh we should return to the caller. So in this case, okay, this is static, normally it should be computed. But once we have the information, we just uh, call, instead of send that sends a string, we call JSON that sends an object. Converse, actually, converse the, objects in, the object into JSON and we'll, then we'll send it. So, uh, if you see this, you see that the response automatically has a, a content type of application JSON because the, the JSON method will automatically send, uh, add the, the, set the header. So we don't need to do it uh, on the response because the JSON method does it for us. And you see that the body actually contains the JSON representation of our objects, of the info object. That will travel in the response back to the caller that can then extract information, do whatever they want. So we can receive information in the request URI with query parameters or URI segments, dynamic segments. We can receive information in the body of the request, in the case of put or post, in JSON. So any complex object can be represented like that. And we can return information basically in the status code or more likely in the response body in JSON format. These are the basic mechanisms that we can have in, in Express. Uh, that's the basic. Then we we'll see other middleware when we want. For example, there are middleware for validation, middleware for authentication, and so on, but we'll see them in, in the coming weeks. Now, the question is, uh, what do we do with that? How do we use these methods? How do we use these mechanisms for this express mechanism for building APIs? A set of functions that can be called. The idea is that, okay, we learned uh, to build a web server. This web server should give us access to the data stored into a database for reading and for modifying it. And our application is our web, our React application, is there. This application needs to read the data uh, and some number from the database or to add an item, uh, a, row, a row in a table in the database. So what's in, the, in between? How can we build this communication, okay? The idea is that uh, we can express the services that we want to offer as HTTP endpoints. So I want to, uh, I don't know, add a question. Let's go back to our example. Well, there should be a one endpoint called question where if I send a post to that endpoint uh, with the information about a the question, then a new question will be added. So I define in terms of uh, HTTP methods and uh, URI segments, URI routes, HTTP routes, the type of services I want to offer. 
the type of operations I want to allow on the underlying database. And all the information will be exchanged in JSON normally. Or either, either as simple strings, maybe as a URI segments, or when the object is more complex, send a JSON uh, object. Um, so let's keep. Uh, so the, the idea is that, is there any guidelines for helping us to structure this set of API endpoints, to service endpoints? Well, actually there is, and we should try to, um, you will see more for which of you that do the next course in uh, distributed system programming, uh, where a good part uh, is devoted to analyzing the best way of integrating you know, uh, concurrent systems. But right now, let's, let's see the basics. We, we should try to think, to abstract a bit over our database and think about our application in terms of uh, items and collections. Our example, items, items are questions and answers. One question is an item, another question is another item. The first answer to the second question is another item. Items belong, or elements, belong to collections. I have a collection of all the questions. I have a collection of all the answers. And then there are relationships, because a uh, question contains answers, or an answer is related to a question. Normally, we can map uh, most of the information that we need uh, using these three abstract concepts and uh, now we just need a rule a practical rule to translate these abstract context concepts into URIs and into HTTP verbs one convention is okay we have a URL and then we use uh, one name for each type of element of collection containing the uh, type of elements. So for example, students, or for us, questions, answers. These URIs represent the collection of all questions, the collection of all answers. And then we will ask ourselves, what kind of operation do we want to allow on that collection? But first of all, we want to represent them. Represent the collection of objects as a string, as a URI. And we want to represent a single object by specifying an identifier within a collection. So what, one, two, three, four, five, six doesn't tell anything by itself, but if we append it to a collection name, we are saying, okay, in the collection of students, pick the one with identifier one, two, three, four, five, six. We identify a collection by just a name an abstract name, we identify an item, a specific item, with a collection name plus an ID. Simple rule, just for giving, we don't have a pointer to say that, uh, that object. We need to specify the object in some way. If I were in the SQL, I would say the, the, the table name and the ID and the primary key. Here we are building some more simplified abstract version for uh, being able to specify objects. And then we will say what kind of operation we can do on this object. We can delete it. We can modify it. Hmm? Mm, best practices suggestion is using nouns and not verbs. It's easy to think about abstract entities as nouns. So information, not actions. And uh, since the nouns are representing collections, Try to do that, uh, to express them in the plural form. Okay? Just a suggestion. And try to be as specific as possible. These names are already abstract by themselves. Don't make them meaningless or too void. And then, what kind of operation can we do on these objects? Well, normally, in a database, a set of data, we can add new data, query, delete, uh, modify, the usual. Okay? Uh, so we encode, we encoded the objects in JSON, easy. They are already JavaScript objects. We encoded the endpoints using, using URIs, 
And now we encode the operations that we can do in HTTP verbs, in HTTP methods. For example, a get applied on an element will give me an object representing all the property of the element. Get questions three, get slash questions slash three, will give me all the information about question three, if it exists. A get method on a collection will give me the list of all the items in the collection, or the list of the IDs of the item in the collection, depending on whether the objects are bigger and returning all of the details, or all the objects could be expensive. But I can get, uh, the get method is used for extract information, for query information. I can query a collection, and the collection will tell me the names of the elements it contains, the IDs or the information. I can query a specific element, so question three, answer 27, and it, give me, it will give me all the details of that element. How? Encoded in JSON. I can use, uh, for creating a new question, or creating a new answer, I could use the, the semantics of post. Post will add information. So I will post to a collection the JSON representation of a new item. So I've been adding to this collection, to the collection of questions, a new question. I'm posting a single object to a collection, and this will add the semantic. What I want to exp express is that this will add one item to the database. Of course, that will be translated into some query, SQL query, insert something into that, okay. But right now, you want to express them in HTTP. So in HTTP, post will mean add. And it, it can post only to a collection. It doesn't, it, that, it, there's no meaning of posting to a single item. A single item cannot, you cannot add another answer to the same answer. It's, it's just one object. What we could do is to modify an object with a put call. Put overrides an already existing object. So I can put onto a single item, a single element, with a new version of itself. I don't want to talk about delete. I always hate deleting something. So, but you can guess. And for example, these are the possibility. If we have URIs representing collections, we can get on that URI, and the implementation should return a list of items. Or we can post to that collection, and this will mean that I'm going to add one element to the collection to insert that into the database. Concerning single elements, and remember that the URI of single elements are always like slash container slash ID. I can get a single element, read it, or I can modify a single element with put. Uh, actually, there are, you can use put or patch with this another method. Semantic usually should be if put should replace the whole object and patch should only replace some properties. Let's not get into these details. Or delete uh, means deleting a single element. So in a way, we are trying to represent all types of information, of operations that we want to be able to do in our database. Simple operations, just create, read, and delete uh, and modify uh, CRUD operations uh, on our database uh, with uh, simple HTTP URLs and HTTP methods. Uh, for example, there are some practical examples. If I have a collection of dogs, each with their own ID, I can get the list of dogs or I can get information about a specific dog. You see that this is a collection URI, this is an item URI because we have the collection plus the identifier. And the meaning of the verbs is that. Um, of course, if you try to, uh, you can just implement what you want or what you need, of course. Uh, I don't want, I don't need to be able to get a list of the whole dogs. Let's, okay, let's not implement this method. I don't want anybody to be able to delete an item. 
Okay, let's not implement the delete method, of course. But if I need this functionality, that's how I can do that. Using that specific HTTP verb method on that specific format of the URL. This has, now we are just calling them HTTP APIs. So there are program interface based on HTTP. Behind that, this reasoning, there's a, a lot of, so some theory that is called normally REST. So we are representing information and uh, uh, operations on, onto information, and that's why our extension is called uh, REST client, remember was not HTTP client. Uh, REST is the name they commonly used. Uh, it's called, uh, it's just acronym that means represent, representational state uh, transfer, something like that, a very complex name. That gives us a lot, if you seek for information about this, call, uh, seek, seek for the REST uh, keyword, that you will find a lot of information, a lot of suggestions, how to create this, uh, uh, for example, it's not something that we make up. This, for example, is a suggestion from, from the Google developer website. It's like, okay, if you are developing for Google, follow these guidelines, which are the same as we had before. Okay, get, post, put onto collection URLs or resource URLs. Of course, the information will travel, if any, will travel into the, into the request and response bodies, and we saw how to fill this part of information and to, and to parse them. Last point uh, is uh, relationships. So right now we can think about adding a new question, adding a new answer, but how can we tell which question, which are the answers related to a question, for example? And uh, we extend the syntax with a third uh, component, collection, identifier, and then the relationship. For example, questions seven slash answers. So question seven identify a specific question object. If we append the name of a relationship, we are asking for the collection of related items. So questions seven answers, if I get this, I will be getting a list of the answers related to question seven. If I put on that, I will be adding a new answer to that specific question, not in general. Yes? Uh, if the database below is a relational database, it should imply probably a join. Put a relationship, maybe one many to many, and maybe many to one, one to one, so it depends on how it's implemented at our level. Right now we're just thinking abstractly, okay? Which is, uh, because I can also do the, the, the opposite question. Get answer 27 slash question. In this case, it should be only one question related to the answer. So it, it's only an item, it's not a collection. Depends, of course. But the idea is that uh, we are thinking of collection of items and then relationships that links this collection of items. And we, and for navigating this collection, we just pick one item on one of the two sites and the other slash describing the type of collection. So we build a URL path on which we can implement the get, post, and delete methods hmm, on collections. Um, there are a lot of uh, suggestions for doing that. Uh, we'll try to not to lose too much time and try just to, to use some common sense and try to stick to the simple rules. Uh, um, in Express, how to implement those? We already know that. We are using the features of JSON parsing of uh, dynamic uh, segments uh, and of uh, extracting and uh, representing the information in JSON. So there's nothing special. Here, I have just uh, for example, that are more patterns for implementing uh, the different types of calls. So in the next hour, what we're trying to do is first to define the set of APIs 
that should uh, so be needed for our uh, question and answer website and then start maybe implementing some of them. Uh, implementation is not difficult. You see that something like this. Uh, I have a, this idea, a DAO object. DAO means data access object. So a, a, a module where I store all the queries for the database. I just need to extract the parameters and call the right query. Implementation is rather, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's rather regular. The difficult part is the design. Thinking about to map all the operations that we need into this rigid scheme, HTTP methods, URIs. But that's for after the break. Thank you.